Well, recently we were talking baseball with a man who hosts a show with the same name as that. Ed Randall joined us in studio to talk about a few hot topics, but we started off with the fact that he is a prostate cancer survivor and research shows early detection leads to a 98% survival rate. And uncovering it is as simple as a blood test. Uh, Fans for the Cure, my charity, advocates that beginning at age 40, for those who have a history of prostate cancer in their families, and 45 years old, for those who do not have a history of prostate cancer in their families, that they simply consult yearly with their doctors and take a PSA, simple PSA blood test that will save their lives the way it saved my life. According to your website, that diagnosis and testing of prostate cancer has actually declined. What is the reason for this? Because I can't, I can't imagine that it is, it's excusable in any way for a man to not know the answer to that question. Uh, very simply, in 1984, the uh, United States government established the, uh, a task force, uh, which was made up and is made up of 16 doctors. Uh, and those doctors in 2012 said that men need not take a PSA blood test to detect prostate cancer. Uh, they then met again uh, earlier this year and they improved the grading of the PSA. Uh, but where we needed a home run for them to really say, yes, take the PSA exam, we got a bun single. However, <laughs> uh, they did sort of advocate that men take the PSA exam. The, to, your, to your question about why have there been less diagnoses, because when men first heard what the joint uh, task force said uh, with regard to the prostate cancer exam, the PSA, they stopped going to take the PSAs. Well, hopefully we can improve the testing and, uh, and get more people out there uh, to get tested. Uh, let's talk a little bit about baseball here. I know you love to talk baseball. I do. Uh, last week I was out at City Field for the day that they opened up the, the new netting. And uh, the fact that they've uh, created a new 30-foot netting uh, that stretches beyond the dugout and then 8-foot netting all the way down uh, the base pads, it's one of less than 10 teams that have actually done this in Major League Baseball as an effort to protect the fans. This is something that became a bit of a hot topic for you on your radio show this past week. Where do you land on this? Uh, I think we need to protect the fans. Uh, I happen to be at a Yankee game sitting in seats. Uh, you and I, when we go to the ballpark, we have the great good fortune to sit in the press box. But this particular night, I had guests, and I was sitting in seats uh, behind the third base dugout, uh, and we were watching the uh, Kansas City Royals play the Yankees in Yankee Stadium. And in that game, uh, Chris Carter, the now departed Chris Carter, uh, his bat went flying into the stands, struck a boy, and he began to bleed. From where I was sitting, Steve, I heard the mother screaming. Under no circumstances ever at a professional sporting event should a parent have to experience something like this. And I think that that was a tremendous example oh, yeah. of why we need screening throughout the 30 teams. The commissioner has left it up to the teams. Uh, the Mets have decided that uh, they were going to be the 10th team to extend the netting, and, uh, and I applaud them. But... Uh, thanks to a uh, bill that was introduced in the city council by Councilman Rafael Espinal. Mm -hmm. I think that that sort of uh, was an impetus for the Mets to do this. Well, there are more than 1,700, uh, uh, either it's a ball or a bat that is ejected into the stands yeah. in, in a professional baseball game every single year. We measure exit velocity at 114 miles an hour. To argue against a netting, just it just makes you sound like a jerk if you don't want netting up there because you think that impedes your, your sight lines to the game. Which well, which it doesn't, by the way. Which it doesn't. Yeah, I, I was standing Mets, three rows behind it. You you can't even see the netting when yeah, you're the right Mets there. Yeah, Mets say 97%. It's, it's invisible, 97%. Uh, uh, Bloomberg Sports uh, estimated that 1,750 people are struck by batted balls or bats uh, in a given season, which is more than the number of batters that are hit by pitches. Wow. 1,651 So fans take it year. more than the batters actually yeah. do.
That's Last amazing. Year they did. Okay, so you mentioned it that 10 teams now actually have this extended netting. The Yankees do not have. They're, they're examining it. They're, they're looking at it right they're now. They're looking at it right okay. now. Okay, well, yeah. they're in the process, but right. they haven't put it up yet. But I'm wondering whether or not the Commissioner Manfred is going to mandate this for every single stadium. I wish, I wish that he would, but he's left it up to the teams. Okay. Unlike the NHL, where uh, a girl was struck by a puck in uh, Columbus, Ohio, at a Blue Jackets game, tragically died, and the commissioner, Gary. Gary Bettman took it upon himself to mandate that there would be netting that would go up in the corners of the rinks in all of the NHL facilities. Maybe they should take a cue from them. Um, let's talk about pace of play. Um, so take your time. <laughs> doing that, I by was going to say, take, take dis your time. despite baseball's best efforts, right. the pace of play has actually increased. It's now three hours and and five minutes so far this year. Right. Is this a fruitless effort right now for baseball to try to shorten the game? I, d I don't think it is, uh, but I. I can tell you that I am almost certain that there's going to be a pitch clock at the major league level next year. Uh, and uh, the players uh, did not want to do that uh, when they had their uh, negotiations for the labor agreement this past December. Uh, but there is going to be a pitch clock imposed. Now, the commissioner uh, said uh, early in the year that he has the power to impose a number of changes without the approval of the Players Association. I don't think it's going to come to that where he's going to use the nuclear option. I think he will, uh, con they are continuing talks with the Major League Baseball Players Association, Tony Clark, the uh, head of the union, uh, that they will hopefully put in place uh, some rules that will improve the pace of play uh, as an the umpires right now are lost, well, Steve. They don't know what to do in terms of enforcing, keeping batters in the batter's box for starters. Well, and do these rules have any teeth? Is there a penalty if you don't follow the rule? And maybe the bigger question is, is, is having this game at two hours and 57 minutes going to make more people want to watch it than 3.05? I mean, baseball is a sport that doesn't have a clock. And I think the baseball enthusiasts and the purists would say, can you really put a clock on excellence? I, and that's and that's a good point. But the Toronto Blue Jays a few weeks ago played a nine inning game that went four hours and thirty two minutes. If uh, you're a baseball fan, you're 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 locked in for those entire four hours. Right. And now there are people, there are fans who say, I don't care how long the game is. Right. I enjoy going there, having a beer, having a hot dog, having conversations with a friend, and and that's fine. But in this in this time of instantaneous communication, uh, I don't know if having a four hour and thirty two minute baseball <laughs> game okay. is serving the best interests of the game in the long run to try to capture the millennials that we so desperately need. Need for the future of the game. You can hear him every Sunday morning talking baseball. I won't sing it. He might. On WFAN, Ed Randall, thank you so much. Steve, great to be with you.